Okay, so um. If I'm not loud enough. Um, so historically, you know, um, control of fluid flows um, is, is not a recent subject. Uh, um, thinking of controlling fluid flows uh, goes back to, easily should go back to Wright brothers. Who are Wright brothers? Couple of Europeans? <laughs> huh? Yeah, wrong people. <laughs> That's a good dance. Who are the Wright brothers? You heard about Wright brothers? Raise your hand. So this is the <laughs> right hand. Actually, it's better than. Yeah, um, the concept of it. He just drew some pictures, <laughs> right? Um, um, <laughs> he, he drew some sketches. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, it's better than when, when I ask, uh, do you know Chandrasekhar, uh, Subramanian Chandrasekhar in Coimbatore? There was one gentleman from the corner raised the hand, nobody else. It was an audience of 100 people. So I asked, uh, so I was very impressed. I wasn't looking who raised the hand. In the lunch time, I looked at him and asked. He was a smaller person. Of course, compared to me, everybody is... <laughs> Uh, and uh, guys, don't talk when I speak. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, so I asked the gentleman, uh, "Where are you from? Uh, which part of India?" And he said, "No, no, I am a Chinese from Malaysia." So, <laughs> so that's the person who knew Chandrasekhar. At least you know who is Wright brothers. Um, so the uh, so the Wright brothers understood that. Um, uh, of course, in order to sustain the flight, hovering and uh, you know flying requires um, um, a, a good understanding on the stability and control of uh, air, airplane wings. That distracts me, <laughs> so don't talk. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so. Um, uh, so the idea of controlling fluid flows, uh, controlling boundary layers, uh, this type of things has been there uh, for a long time. Um, I think um, the idea of heating the boundary uh, so that you increase the temperature nearby. If you increase the temperature, what happens to the viscosity? You heard about? Uh, you probably from the cars and so forth, right? It, uh, the viscosity decreases. Right, so uh, and therefore you can see that you can play with the new uh, by heating. So that's been uh, people have thought about that, and um, and then uh, in the 40s and um, in the 40s in particular, um, my advisor, uh, his advisor, and people like that, uh, his advisor, um, uh, thought about optimum aerodynamic shapes. So. Those are called optimum aerodynamic shapes. Um, so optimum aerodynamic shapes, um, uh, the names if you have studied um, these days, you know, they don't teach what's called the classical aerodynamics, uh, essentially based on uh, potential theory. Um, particularly low speed is just a Laplace uh, operator, but um, you need to come up with, uh, you need to have a good understanding of complex analysis to understand the cutter condition, things like why you have lift and things like that. Why do you have lift? Potential theory. How many you can answer? Who, how many engineers here? Say, say it again. Yeah, but why do you have, uh, so that is when you have a circulation. It's essentially integrate the velocity around the curve of the curve. You should have non-zero. Yeah, around the, so that is then essentially you calculate it by residue theorem in complex analysis. Um, so um, in understanding the lift and drag in, in, the, in, the, in the potential theoretic setting, people have come up with um, what should be the best shape, both uh, low speed and high speed. And uh, the names uh, are like one, Common and um, Theodore von Kármán, uh, and then WR C 
spheres, you will see in, in, in aerodynamics, um, uh, there is one common profile, uh, C, um, CS profile and so forth in airfoils in low and high speeds. You can go and, and um, so when I went to, so when I went to US, I wanted to study uh, high speed aerodynamics all along. There was no question. Um, uh, so, uh, so um, I met a student of uh, CS, his name is uh, ARC Bass. C A B A S S, and he's very well known in transonic flow. Uh, so I went and worked with him. And C S at that time, they both uh, C S retired from Cornell, went to Arizona, and uh, he went to Arizona because the, he came from Cornell, the University of Washington. Water um, in that uh, Seattle wasn't uh, allergic to him or something, so we all went to <laughs> Arizona. Um, and um, so, um, so uh, Dixie Bass. Um, uh, forced me a problem, which is he said um, we want to do something like uh, this type of uh, thing for supersonic delta wings. Um, uh, I can tell you in a, some another more uh, time, uh, maybe second part of the, uh, in the next lecture uh, about uh, delta wings and how to modify uh, wing shapes so that you get the bow shock uh, eliminated. You may uh, sorry the body shock. The bow shock is always there when you have supersonic flow. And um, so, um, let's draw some pictures so that you understand what is uh, meant by, um, you know, uh, this transonic, supersonic, and what is happening here. If you start with a cylinder, uh, in uh, uh, forget the viscosity. Viscosity brings something else. Just um, uh, inviscid flow and um, uh, circular cylinder. And then um, you increase the speed. Uh, speed is actually the, the far field velocity. Let's call it a mark in mark number is uh, mark number is essentially the far field velocity over divided by the sound speed of sound, right? That's called the mark number. So around point uh, four nine mark number uh, uh, mark number point nine. So when the Mach number is uh, it's not supersonic now, it's, 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 um, uh, it's uh, half the speed of sound, uh, a little dot develops. And that at that point, the local Mach number, so the velocity u divided by c, u is actually, if you know potential flow, the potential is uh, that's equal to vector u. So the gradient u, uh, gradient phi, divided by the sound speed c, uh, c squared is actually uh, d phi by d rho. Pressure. Um, so if you evaluate it, you will find that the Mach number becomes one. So when the Mach number is around 0.49, the Mach number uh, uh, around the body becomes one. And then uh, you go a little bit faster. So if you go a little bit faster, what happens is you, a bubble forms. The bubble forms, usually terminated by a shock wave. So inside this region, it is uh, Mach number is bigger than one. Outside the region, the Mach number is less than one, and uh, the 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 differential uh, equation is elliptic outside, and inside it is hyperbolic. So in the 1950s, this is the most famous problem um, that challenged the PDE experts because it's a PDE of mixed type. Uh, with uh, sh uh, shock here. This is a steady state problem I'm describing. Uh, so if you see some of the books, uh, they even draw characteristics like that because it's a, like a nonlinear counterpart of the trichomy, trichomy problem. Uh, so the, uh, and, and also if you are lucky enough to sit near, a, near the wing of, um, in, the, in your transport, and so through the window when you watch, the wing is like that, right? And you will be sitting from here, you may see a shadow line like that which uh, move around. So uh, that is uh, nothing but uh, there's a bubble. Uh, there's a supersonic bubble, this bubble whose section I am showing, terminated by the shock wave. So you actually see the shock wave. Shock wave is a pressure um, drop or pressure increase uh, or density increase. And therefore, the light refracts and you see a line. 
So for a long time, this was an impetus. Uh, how can you change the shape uh, so that you will not have this body shot wave? And that was the challenge in the 60s and 50s. So there was uh, actually a book by um, uh, Angelo Miley. I think his name is Miley. M-I-E-L-I-E-S. I think he was in the Rice University. And um, see, so he wrote a book on optimal aerodynamic shapes. Not much on transonic flow, but the other shapes. And uh, the transonic optimization problem was actually due to uh, Dixie Bass and uh, Sobieski and others. And then uh, I did a corresponding thing for supersonic flows when you have bow shocks and um, uh, body shocks. So what happens if I keep increasing the Mach number? So what happens is, um, uh, so the Mach number is very high, then the sonic bubble is like that, and it forms a shock wave like that. So this is a supersonic region. And, um, and then the, so this is Mach number is fairly high. It's not necessarily, you know, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.9 or something like that. It's been said that the uh, wing section and the wire has the same drag because of these guys, a circular cylinder is nasty. And then if you really increase the Mach number, what happens is there's a bow shock wave and the tail shock wave. So, and inside it is uh, M is bigger than one, uh, sorry, M is uh, less than one. And then M is again bigger than 1, M is bigger than 1. So this is uh, the elliptic region. And this is the, what's called the bow shock. And this is called the tail. So in the, and this is your cylinder. So what happened in uh, 1960s is um, uh, the, there was this re-entry vehicle, you know, when they, when they send rockets to moon, they had to come back. So the capsule comes back. It comes back as a fairly, you know, it's, it looks like an ob object like that, right? Half sphere. Um, so people were very interested in computing the shock wave. And at that time, the shock uh, capturing methods were not there. That's why Gudunov was thinking about this one. So what they did was um, they said, well, prescribe a, a shape and solve the elliptic problem by marching. If you have done inverse problems, you know that that's not a well-posed problem. So that uh, stimulated people like Tikhonov uh, to think uh, study uh, ill-posed problem. So the, uh, the aerodynamic, I, I was saying this one to, um, and then in the 19, 1971, probably the first uh, successful shock capturing scheme was uh, advanced by Earl Merman and Cole and also Jameson. Uh, so these days is uh, what you take for granted, the shock capturing methods for Euler equations. Uh, it sort of um, started motivated by these uh, re-entry problems and supersonic problems and so forth. So it is natural to ask, what should be the shape, uh, maybe to have the minimum drag profile. When they designed Concorde, they were thinking about that. When uh, the fighter planes were uh, you know, designed to through the sonic barrier, they were thinking about that. So. Uh, since I thought about this subject uh, during the thesis days, a um, few years down the line, uh, I, was, I wanted to bring actually a bona fide control theory into um, in the fluid mechanics. And that sort of um, explains why I got into control theory of fluid mechanics. And uh, I wasn't, uh, I was a bit scared of uh, shape optimization problems because shape optimization, when you give a variation, that messes up the equation, right? Very messy things to handle. Anyway, so uh, what we will do is uh, today I will talk about the deterministic control theory of uh, Navier-Stokes equation. And uh, tomorrow we will uh, speak a little bit about stochastic control theory and Navier-Stokes equation. Why is the subject developed in incompressible flow? Because in the early 80s and mid 80s, late 80s, when people start very seriously thinking about it, the best theory in fluid mechanics was, uh, believe it or not, for incompressible viscous flow. Everything else was sort of partial. Uh, not good enough uh, oil equations for in, uh, in a compressible oil were in not in good shape. Uh, so that's why it developed in incompressible flow. Uh, this doesn't mean you shouldn't go to compressible flow, right? This is time to uh, or incorporate shock waves. And people are beginning to uh, do this.
Okay, so in order for us to understand uh, what is the underlying mathematical structure of um, control theory of um, fluid dynamics or control theory of any dynamics, maybe it is uh, useful to go back and look at um, um, a classical branch of physics which uh, actually gave imp impetus actually to quantum theory, for example, uh, so many good deal of uh, stochastic calculus, path integrals and so forth, and also to optimal control theory. So, what is this subject? What is the subject which motivated the optimal control theory that uh, existed before? That is the classical mechanics, calculus of variations, classical mechanics, that whole body of literature which we study, that is essentially the underlying uh, principle in this uh, adjoint equation and all that, uh, Hamilton Jacobi theory. So, that is the viewpoint I wanted to leave you behind, leave behind today, uh, today and tomorrow. So, we go back. So, recall calculus of uh, variations and uh, optimal control, right. Um, it gives me a chance to talk about um, the type of questions you immediately go and ask. But, uh, trust me or not, the, the state space characterization of H infinity also comes from this. So, how do you formulate uh, a calculus of a calculus of variation problem. You say that uh, okay, you want to go from uh, a time t uh, time t equal to a time t equal to b. Um, uh, of course, uh, functional which you call Lagrangian of t y of t and y. Usually, you don't write it, but you know that it's a path is uh, so that it looks it doesn't look very clumsy. Y dot dt you want to minimize. So, what is the first question you usually when you uh, write down y like this, what is the first um, conclusion you come up with in your classes? How many of you study calculus of variations? Good. So, what do you what do you remember? Some variation you give, yeah. Eventually, what do you remember? Euler-Lagrange Euler Lagrange equations. So the Euler-Lagrange equations. Can you remember the Euler-Lagrange equation? We had a picture of uh, Lagrange, I think, in the. Um, in the Wyoming math department, they had Euler Lagrange equation at the bottom of Lagrange's picture. So, can you remember? Uh, D L by D Y D Y Y or Y dot Y minus D by D T D L by D Y dot C equal to 0. What did this thing gives you? This is called the necessary condition, right. So, in order for you to go from here to here, um, you need actually an existence theorem that uh, there is an optimal curve. So, the, this what this tells you is that you know you want to go from in the simplest setting, I just want to put fixing points, uh, go from one point to the other by a curve yt and let us call y star be the optimal trajectory that minimizes this uh, functional, action functional as it is known in classical mechanics, we can call it cost functional <laughs> if you like. Uh, suppose there is an optimal curve, then uh, you have that uh, holes. Now, for, um, for centuries they were supposing and there were some attempts to prove special cases, the best results came uh, in the uh, yeah, uh, last part of, uh, um, um, sorry, early part of last century by Tonelli. And uh, so, the, uh, so then essentially in the existence level, so the, that is the Euler-Lagrange equation on the other side. Uh, 
So the best results is uh, depends on whether L of t y dot uh, is, is convex or not. Okay, so if with respect to y dot, do you have convexity, right? What is convexity? Convexity should look something like this, right? So it is uh, uh, L of, uh, forget L, maybe F of um, y lambda 1 y1, if this is uh, point y1 plus uh, sorry, lambda 1 minus lambda y2 less than or equal to lambda f of y1 plus 1 minus lambda f of y2. So, with respect to where lambda is, so with respect to the speed, if it is convex, then we call it tonally existence theorem. You can read about it, I can only make you go and say, when it is non-convex, is attributed to when, so this is convex, non-convex, it is due to LC, Young. So, if you have heard about Young measures, let's say we spoke about Wright brothers, now we can talk about Young measures and Old measures. So, <laughs> this is Young measures, uh, is a notion you need and I will briefly sketch at uh, some point if you get a chance. Um, uh, to um, characterize what type of curves for which uh, this one achieves a minimum. So you need, so let's say you have, so that uh, with that, those two theories, the theory of young measures which, uh, for which you had integrate uh, with respect to measure, otherwise as it is, as long as it's convex, because the whole thing will be then uh, lower semi-continuous, the existence theory is sort of settled. And we will carry that one when we go to control problems and ask under what condition we have existence of optimal control. Now the, let's, um, so let's see, that's a hard equation actually, you know, you probably need all of uh, undergraduate and probably some graduate to um, you know, say existence, but in undergraduate itself, depending on what's your course, either you use in structural analysis, or vibration, di vibration of um, uh, engine vibrations or whatever, depending on whether it's a ME, civil engineering, physics or applied math, you will study this one. So, I want to define another variable, theta. So, my original equation, okay, let us define another variable. Uh, so, theta uh, t, let me call this one dy by dy dot, okay. So, So, if I do that, notice that um, uh, then, uh, then this implies, what do you get? d theta by dt is equal to dl by d by, agree? Agree? Not agree? Because this is theta, so if I put d theta by dt is equal to dl by d by, everybody agree? Let us uh, define a new entity called Hamiltonian. Right now, I will uh, do it like classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, they immediately write everything for the optimal curve and therefore, there is no pseudo Hamiltonian, what is called a true, ha true Hamiltonian. Uh, but let us do it li like that. So, define a Hamiltonian, so that this Hamiltonian is going to be of course, function of time, that is okay and function of y and uh, function of theta, I define it this way. Uh, I write it as theta times dy by dt. By the way, this theta we will give a name, let us call it momentum. And we will also later call this one a joint variable.
Okay, because later on when you go to the PDE, functional analysis, boundary condition, jungle, you want to know <laughs> what is this a joint, where did it come from. So, um, so let's define something called Hamiltonian. I'm going to, this is, is a function of time, I leave it. The y. The y is my, uh, you know, that's my state variable y and this momentum. So, I define it as um, uh, this momentum times that minus the Lagrangian, the whole thing here. So, it is L. If you want, maybe it's write it uh, like y dot so that it does not look uh, <coughs> t y y dot. Then notice that, notice that what is uh, dy by dt? Uh, how do you pick up dy by dt? I have a problem here. So, I, what do you, how do you get dy by dt from here? I want this guy, so I differentiate this with, with respect to theta, okay? So, that is equal to Do you agree? Hmm? If I take partial derivative with theta, I kill this one. There is no theta here. I get y dot. Likewise, what is uh, d theta by dt? Good. Yeah, that is equal to, so uh, without messing up, let us uh, take a look at it. So, that is equal to dl by dy dot, uh, right? So, theta, theta I, I already uh, wrote this one. This is equal, d theta by dt is what I want as dl by dy, right? So, dl by dy is also same as this one with a negative sign and therefore, I get dh by dy. We agree with this much, we are in very good shape. Agreed? Why? Because I defined um, I, I, I defined theta as dl by dy dot and therefore I run back to the Euler Lagrange equation. Euler Lagrange equation says then d theta by dt is dl by dy, but dl by dy is same as uh, the differentiating the Hamiltonian with respect to uh, with respect to y right with a negative okay so these two beauties are called hamilton, hamilton equations so that's the classical mechanics picture there's a little bit more to it you actually define um, so now i erase these things i define What is called a value function? So, remember my trajectory started from A, but I will start from some generic point, uh, generic time tau, and let us say that the initial point is, uh, uh, let us call it little x. And so, starting from that, I will essentially follow an optimal curve. So, that is uh, y star. So, what I will do is now I will start at uh, point tau. So, my optimal curve is here. So, this will be a function after the integration, this will be a function, follow the convention, it will be a function of tau and little x, because I have integrated over everything else. It is also equivalent to actually starting from here and then minimizing this uh, integral. That s is uh, historically the correct s, not because I am trying to name after myself. Uh, so. Uh, that's this is called um, the action functional. So this um, S, it turns out that this S will satisfy. We will derive hopefully that H 
why there is a explicit time variance in there that is ok, y and d s by d x equal to 0. So, so that is uh, called the Hamilton Jacobi equation. Time to tell a lot of stories. This goes back to uh, Jacobi lectures, I think um, uh, more than 150 years ago, a lot longer. When was the Jacobi lecture? Anybody know the history of mechanics? 1750. 1850. Um, so this is actually goes back to uh, the Jacobi lecture. The ideas is, um, so what did I do here? Notice that I replace theta by ds by dx. So Jacobi's idea is that um, you solve this partial differential equation. So all of a sudden we, st we were talking about an ODE, right? ODE may be one dimensional or n dimensional, um, you know, this problem. We wrote down two ODEs and all of a sudden I have a partial differential equation here, right? So this is um, one of the first connection between uh, 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 optimizing a finite dimensional system and uh, getting uh, this one. So, notice that my adjoint variable or the momenta is now connected with the first spatial derivative of the action function less. less. This is going to come back again um, later on. Okay, so what uh, the, the best thing to do now, forget this star because they in, in, in classical mechanics they do not put that. We will do it in a much more careful way. This much everybody is fine with it, right? This derivation I will show you. And uh, so now let us, uh, uh, the best thing is to, how to go to control theory is to maybe go back and try to con convert this to a control problem. Um, who uh, connected first to control is uh, Richard Bellman. And um, so Art Kreener in, uh, he was in UCSD, but he's also a um, uh, senior control theorist, always tells the story that uh, Bellman in the 50s did not acknowledge that it came from this, apparently. <laughs> These are people do this. So, he once gave a talk in USC and there was this very smart graduate student kept asking that, uh, isn't it connected to <laughs> Jacobi's <laughs> classical mechanics? And then, uh, well, and then he said, you know, there is this book I studied, uh, uh, checked out from the library and it is in there. <laughs> this derivation of Hamilton Jacobi, what I talking about, Bellman this dynamic programming equation is, uh, is in there, Bellman denied and then the student went to the back side and there was, um, you know, when you borrow a book, there is this uh, names are there and there was Richard Bellman checked out the book for a long time. So, so he then pointed out, sir, uh, you know, I looked at the back and looked like you have checked out this book for a long time. So Bellman said, you look like a smart guy, why don't we go to lunch together? <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> It's a good way to go to lunch together. Um, anyway, so how do you go to, uh, what is the control problem? Can we convert this to a control problem? So what we do, do is uh, the simplest control problem you can think about is dy by dt is equal to some control u. Later on, uh, so that simple observation will immediately convert it to a control problem. So now, first stay here, here. So stay here before um, we go to the next section. So let us look at this side. This is then becomes what is called a cost functional, cost functional, however it is pronounced. So here this is essentially if y is the velocity, then u is like how you press the accelerator, right? So that is the simplest control problem. And um, so there are some interesting connections you will immediately see. And um, so it turns out that I had to say, say show the connections. Um, uh, the then the optimal control uh, u will be equal to d will be equal to the adjoint variable, and it's also in turn equal to dv by dx evaluated over the optimal trajectory. This connection is what? Oh, sorry. S. This connection is what we are after. So the optimal control. Uh, it turns out that that minimizes this one. Uh, in this simple, if you uh, formulate this as a quadratic in u, so if you write L of t y u as some theta of uh, t y plus uh, half uh, u squared, and uh, 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 with this uh, 
um, speed or the dynamical system, this you get this simple equality. The adjoint is nothing but equal to your optimal control, but is the adjoint is also equal to the spatial derivative, the what Jacobi uh, found the connection between the adjoint and the derivative of the action function, right? So that, uh, but this also gives you a nice uh, feedback control problem. So if your control, if your control has to be u, the state variable is uh, y, all you need to do is to compute the ds by dx, evaluate uh, along the optimal trajectory and that gives you the feedback, right? And uh, so that uh, is a fully nonlinear feedback that would minimize this functional because you are given, you know how to calculate the functional optimal control either by solving this adjoint equation. This equation is going to be running in the backward or by solving the hamilton jacobi equation. Okay, so I was not the first one to generalize this to more um, complicated problems. It was Bellman who did the hamilton jacobi and it was Pontryagin and his students who generalized this to a general, more general looking uh, ODE with the target constraints and all that, um, um, Pontryagin and his uh, uh, Gamkletsi and Mischenko, I think, uh, three. Um, so they uh, did this, they completed this picture. So that was the ODE setting. Now the question is, can you do this for the Navier-Stokes equation? Is there any other theory available? Actually not, because this is, it has to be this. Because if you go and say, now I want to replace by a, this by a partial differential equation where the control appears on the right hand side or on the boundary, and I want to minimize some functional, this is the mathematics to follow. Just that you had to do this in infinite dimensions, right? Okay, so let's go back and start. So we will, I will show you how the adjoint look like in the Navier-Stokes case. I will show you how the Hamilton-Jacobi equation looks like in the Navier-Stokes case. Right, that's fair enough for, for the deterministic control. And it turns out that there's even more. If you actually linearize this one, you get a Riccati equation. And that uh, connects the, the whole Riccati equation, linear feedback, uh, quadratic control, and so forth. Yeah, leave it for a while. Let's go and, uh, so instead of this, now I want to run to the Navier-Stokes equation. So in the full picture of control of fluid flows, shape optimization I spoke about, optimizing shock waves and so forth, we are only making a little dent. The, the um, more interesting problems uh, would be, you know, flow with shock waves and so forth, uh, controlling either um, changing the shape of the boundary or uh, controlling on the, uh, uh, try to dampen the shock waves and so forth. So control of Navier-Stokes equation. So we write, uh, forgive me for writing velocity field as y because uh, you have a u, big u, little u, so it's um, good to write it this way plus nu of a of y plus uh, b, the bilinear form of y, is equal to maybe some nonlinear operator or linear operator acting on some control u. Usually customary to write that as b, so we have a notation problem, but it's, okay, see, so it is equal to some initial data. Uh, let's write it as y naught in h. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, because um, um, that is in the what's called the classical form. You want to point-wise describe the velocity as u of x and t, and uh, then you write it. Um, you have velocity u of x t. Then you say it is d by d t, right? That's when you actually see the flow field. In, the, in this uh, formulation, you actually um, put uh, the entire velocity field inside a Hilbert space, right? So a point u 
actually describes, uh, uh, that is why it is better to write u dot t. It belongs to the Hilbert space. So, it actually the uh, one point is the whole velocity field. It is like taking this whole temperature field inst instantaneously in this room and putting into square integrable temperature field is let us say t of x t. And then I say I want to define a, a room is omega dx. So, I want to consider all temperature uh, fields which are uh, square integrable. So, that gives me some abstract Hilbert space where I just put t of uh, t only, suppress the x, remember, okay. So, spatial dependence is suppressed because we are evolving on a Hilbert space. Okay, so that uh, dy by dt you saw in the classical calculus of variation problem. Now turned into this uh, monster, why right? we cannot help it because that is what we want to control. So, we, do, we have these extra two terms and then there is something here. This part we spoke quite a bit, what does this part uh, signifies? In fact, um, uh, control theory there was quite a bit of um, literature uh, particularly when uh, before the nonlinear what is called the distributed parameter systems PDE control take, um, took really precedence. Before that, uh, they were very interested in uh, characterizing this n uh, so that um, your system is controllable, stabilizable, detectable and this kind of uh, issues. Why? Because if you think of um, a linear ODE system, just uh, dx by dt, dx1 by dt to dxn by dt. And um, on the right hand side, let us say you do not have control over most of it and then you have, why do not I write it? <laughs> so, the intuition, um, so now the, the new object is this one. So, this can be as it is, it can be boundary control. Boundary control, body force, force, so you could say localized. What is a body force? Anything that appears on the right hand side is called body force. Um, or finite dimensional control, finite number of, of modes. So, it actually embodies, uh, embodies all three whether you can localize the control physically, localize it in the frequency space, right, uh, or apply on the boundary. Just that the nature of n is different. But the point I was going to make is that uh, if you have an ODE, dx1 by dt, dxn by dt, easy to see if, you, if I just put everything as a diagonal system. So let us say dia, lambda 1 to lambda n, 0, 0 x1 to xn. So, it is an uncoupled system of n-dimensional ODEs. Now, if I want to control and then only if I apply control over the first one and nothing here, right, intuitively think about it because this is the starting point of what is happening to whether you can control or not. So, I have an uncoupled system because dx1 by dt is equal to lambda1 x1 and so forth. Will I be able to control by just putting a control like that? Will I be able to go from one for any point to any point? Why? You have control over just one variable. Yeah, only in one variable. And so what? If you put um, a cup of coffee in the microwave uh, and heat, the whole thing, if you heat long enough, the whole thing boils and worst thing can happen. So, you appear to, but the uh, microwave um, is, uh, you know that it is called microwave because it has been heating in a certain frequency. So, presumably, it is only exciting certain modes uh, in the temperature field, in if you just uh, crudely think about it, right. So, how come there it, uh, or oh, maybe uh, that type of systems it appear to work? Yeah, they are interacting. So, here each mode is evolving differently, right? Each mode is x1, um, xi is equal to t is equal to xi 0 exponential lambda 1, lambda i t. Each mode is evolving uh, uh, separately. 
and therefore you, 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 there's no way you can uh, maneuver all of them to, to a given point by just applying in one place, right? And therefore, there is a compromise between the structure of interaction between modes and how you control it. And that actually leads to a very famous theorem, uh, so something, it looks something like this one. You can go and look up dx by dt is equal to ax plus bu. Then controllability requires that a, a, b, a squared b, that matrix a of n minus 1 b has to be a full rank. That is called Kalman rank condition. So, so there is something about interactions. Um, so now let's come back to the Navier-Stokes equation. Do we have interaction of modes if I Fourier expand this equation? Will you have or won't you have? Forget the control. Is there an interaction between modes, different modes? If you write u in Fourier series, right, this is a Laplacian, uh, apply Laplacian. It's different modes are going to, we, we are not going in any hurry. I can get rid of this and um, so even Fourier transform. Uh, even Fourier transform a heat equation, uh, think of Fourier transforming a heat equation, so you get K T by dt, forget, if you forget the pressure for a moment, minus Laplacian, so what happens to the Laplacian when you Fourier transform? Louder. Yeah, minus K squared, right, U hat. So that, so that is, uh, so far, is there any coupling between frequencies? Yeah, it looks just like that model I wrote, right? So these two, these terms don't couple. This looks just like that equation, right? So the coupling is coming through here somehow, different frequencies. And uh, so, it is, so there's a chance that you can um, apply controls of in lower dimensions. Uh, or boundary or you know um, um, uh, localized control which are not you're not don't have to force every modes to to control this is the so it's because the other term uh, I don't want to write it here but if you Fourier uh, it, it can be written as a convolution this gives you the coupling it doesn't contribute to the energy but that's okay when you go to h1 norm it immediately couples that's called you know this um, Kolmogorov um, um, these cascadings and so forth. There are very sophisticated mechanisms that uh, that B generates. Anyway, so with that in mind, the, the whole turbulence is about uh, how different modes are being interacting here. So we have some chance that, okay, so the, 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 the mode interaction is actually also helps you to uh, come up with uh, some lower dimensional control. Okay, so we, uh, we come back. So I assure you that um, if you're just only interested in abstract formulation, Hamilton Jacobi and so forth, all the cases I wrote can be brought here as uh, the Balakrishnan lifting of boundary to the right hand side. But if you actually want to devise numerical method like uh, Professor Ravindran was talking about, then uh, it's, it's, it's the constructions are different. Okay, so we, we, uh, so we have the equation, I made a comment, now we write down a course functional. So in the classical mechanics, I had a Lagrangian so I write something like that here. Shouldn't use the same. Okay, so what can we write down for? So we want to write something very similar to uh, Euler-Lagrange equation for the simplest formulation. So I in the in the Hilbert space H, H, hopefully I want to start from a point. Let's say, why not? 
and um, go to another point, uh, let us say y of uh, t. You do not have to actually go to a point, you can go to a set, uh, but then that uh, is, is like the what is called the um, control theory counterpart of Zemelo's uh, problem, where a dog has to swim from uh, one side of the river to a rock. How many of you know the Zemelo's problem in calculus of variation? But you know, I do not know the dogs swim here in through rivers, but it is a problem about a dog starting from here and uh, want to go inside one uh, hit, uh, hit a rock. It is also that problem also turned out to be also important in what is called the moon landing problem. Once the Apollo you know goes close to the moon, then you want to go and land where you want like to and, and also you should have a soft landing. So, the final speed has to be 0. And um, so, the moon landing problem you work with what is called a Goddard did a rocket equation. This is, a, this is all worked out in Fleming very nicely, Fleming and Richel. Um, so, we have something like that. The, we want to have um, some um, end state where the flow field should look like, you know, in, in a certain way. We want to put some constraint on, on that. The more sophisticated theorem will have uh, that kind of statements. But right now, let us not worry about it. We want to go from time A to time B, and I want to write down a course functional that depends on may or may not depend on y, uh, t, but y and uh, the control variable u, because I already replaced, uh, rep uh, what do you call, replaced y dot by that dt, and I will say well, that goes to infimum. So, that I developed this uh, uh, ideas parallel to uh, classical mechanics. How can you write down this uh, course functional? Can you tell me a course functional? So, the cost functional, let us write it down as a, b, and let us say it is a half u squared plus dt, sorry, y. So, this is my this is my Lagrangian, t, there is no t dependence here, so it is y and u. So, the problems you want to ask, the questions you want to ask. So, you have seen the fractional power of operator A before, if you want you can go back and write it as um, uh, gradient u or whatever. The, uh, the first question is, can you prove existence of optimal control? The second question we wrote down is, uh, can you write down the necessary conditions. So, the necessary condition we started off as Euler Lagrange equation and then I said it is due to Pontryagin. So, that is um, uh, the, the theorem we are after is what is called the Pontryagin maximum principle. For the context of Navier-Stokes equation. And the third question I wrote down um, is, uh, of course, we give the credit to uh, Bellman because Bellman's ideas were not only um, adapted, even though he started with, uh, um, uh, you know, Euler Lagrange and uh, Jacobi's ideas, the discrete version became picked up in computer science and also in uh, communication theory. For example, if you have studied some communication theory, you know, you, you have certain message and then you convert to ones and zeros and in the receiver, you had to decode. The decoding is uh, the well-known decoding you probably use in many of the desire devices called the Viterbi decoding. It 
Mr. Turgi was uh, teaching in USC at the same time uh, Bellman. I don't know whether he's a student of Bellman. So Viterbi decoding uh, is, is, is based on dynamic programming, these uh, this, uh, ideas of Bellman. So the third uh, one is uh, Bellman gave the name dynamic programming. And that is the Hamilton-Jacobi Hamilton -Jacobi equation we like to derive. And this is, in fact, uh, since I wrote down an equality, this adjoint variable control and the derivative of the value function. So that actually gives uh, that feedback characterization. All the other sophistications, such as um, H infinity control or robust control, or uh, optimal stopping and um, uh, impulse control, all of them are more specializations of this, uh, this idea. OK, so the first question is um, existence of optimal control. So we start with that question. So this is an example. Assume that we, you write your own control that is a function of the velocity, function of the control. So the existence of optimal control is written this, uh, like this. So the existence of optimal control, um, first um, you write a let, um, let L be convex and um, uh, cause it uh, in uh, uh, U. This was the question post uh, discussed before. If not coerciveness, uh, then you should have some minimum. Uh, so, um, uh, Pierre, uh, J. Lyons would often uh, pose it as uh, he would like to have this course functional going to plus infinity as the norm of suitable norm of u goes to infinity. So it sort of behaves uh, in the far, fee, far away when the norm of the control blows up, it sort of goes up so that the minimum does not occur in the far at infinity. It occurs around the bounded regions. Okay, so if this is true, uh, and then let's say we pose a very simple problem. Uh, let uh, uh, U, you seek uh, within the class, let's say L2, 0, T, uh, H. I wanted to simplify. Um, 0, T, H. Uh, then, first of all, I am not writing it as a theorem. I am sort of uh, writing it like a discussion. Then, first of all, in 2D, 2D, there exists a unique solution. Navier-Stokes equation such that such that u belongs to what u belongs to l two zero t domain of a half as we have seen several times l infinity zero t h and uh, the derivative actually u t belongs to l two zero t um, d a minus half. y, thank you, y t. Okay, so um, heuristically what we are doing here is that we want to um, take what is called an admissible class. We want to say that the control should be in some function space uh, for which you should be able to write uh, solubility. So um, the millennium price problem is still with us. It's not, uh, um, it is not, then there are some subtle uh, optimal control theorems but, uh, based on what is called generic solubility theory. But um, so you apply the control and you should be able to any control in this class for which uh, this norm is finite, any control for which uh, 0 to t ut h squared dt is finite, uh, you have trajectories and that is what um, so you have actually yt well defined in the function space h. <coughs> so you need to start with that so that we can go to next uh, stage control theory. 
and uh, you may have heard that this admissible class business, right? Uh, admissible class is defined as um, class of uh, controls and class of solutions such that the cost functional will be finite, right? You heard about that. Is this class admissible class? What do you want to see? Finiteness of the, Finiteness of the cost functional. Because uh, essentially, you want to know whether you pick a function space for the control. It will say that, OK, it's square integrable in time, but not. And then you go and prove a solubility theorem for the, the controlled differential equation, state equation. And you get some integrability condition for the solution also. Right? Now, if you want to talk about optimal control that minimizes, so you want to pick a trajectory because you apply different controls, the trajectory will go differently, right? It's just like going from one place to the other. So, uh, but um, what's the point in talking about what is the best trajectory for if, if these trajectories correspond to infinite amount of fuel <laughs> to go from here to Bangalore, right? So the cost functional has to be finite. And I also said that the cost functional we pick has to be coercive, means that as you get uh, the control values go to infinity, it goes to infinity. So the, 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 the optimum is going to occur in some bounded interval. Now can you look at the blackboards, this blackboard exercise we did Saturday, and say whether the cost functional is admissible? Is it admissible? Manil is uh, shaking, so it's okay. Uh, I know it's an Indian note. It means that bus is okay. <laughs> is it admissible? What do you need to look at? Cost functional, right? Where are the cost functional? Which blackboard? That blackboard. So we go to this blackboard, right? And say there are two terms here. This term and that term. This term is, is what? That's precisely the condition I wrote, finite uh, L2 norm. This one, this is the V norm, right? So this is also finite, and that is also finite. So, so the solubility theorem for Navier-Stokes will also ensure that your cost functional is finite to, to, to begin with. OK, so, so the existence theorem will be um, um, easy to state. After that, uh, the, I can maybe sketch the uh, main idea. The main idea is that um, write down the cost functional as uh, j. And, um, why, the, why should the admissible class be non-empty? One more question we'll ask. Can you find any you control and uh, solution such that uh, this statement is, not, is a, not an empty statement? Is it an empty statement? What's the point in optimizing if you have nothing, <laughs> nothing to optimize with? You understand? Understand the question? Can you find one path? Why? You said yes. Why? Say it again. Existence theorem. Yeah. How do you know that there is at least one? Not by Ladizanski Prodi theorem. By simple means. And we are talking about fluid mechanics inside a container. How do you know that? Uh, in this theorem, even before I go and say that, OK, I can find an optimal pair so that this achieves a minimum, how do you know that this uh, admissible class is non-empty? Is it non-empty? Because you sometimes when you do this uh, big, uh, lot of pure math, we forget that we should go back to our <laughs> basics. And uh, remember, the this was sort of used by 
uh, uh, some of the earlier lectures, this type of uh, simple tricks, new a y plus b y. You give me a, any y, any velocity field in this room with the zero boundary on that. So I, I plug in here, I plug in here, and I plug in here, and hopefully I'll get to the right hand side. Uh, that's where the n comes in. So you may not always get that uh, right hand side. But if, if I just have a u, then it's easy to argue that if I plug in any smooth function, I get a right hand side. So admissible class is non-empty. It may not maneuver you from one point to the other, the specific point, but this is because you can always plug in something, get a nice function that is quite integrable and so forth. So it is uh, non-empty. Anyway, so that Leon's vision, well, of course, it's uh, well known, is that uh, the cos functional may wiggle around here, but it goes to infinity here. For Bay, uh, this is your, let's say, your h space, this is your j. The specific uh, form of the cos functional is not important here. Maybe the moment I uh, wrote down a halves and things like that is not important uh, here. So, so the idea is that um, your control, so j is a function of, uh, think of it as a function of u. So when you go to infinity, the cos functional goes to infinity, but we are seeking a minimum. And therefore, it should occur uh, in some finite uh, area, right? So, so we draw a line r and uh, pick r large enough. And, uh, uh, and therefore, and then look at all the controls that are inside that r, right? So now I bound the control and, um, and say that uh, if I take r large enough, Whatever the, um, whatever the control here, this should have been actually L2, 0 th, the full uh, state space. Um, so I, I should have this one. And um, how do you know that uh, the, the optimal control is contained in such a set? Because it's, it's because of this condition, coerciveness condition. Um, that u, L2, 0 t, h goes to infinity. <laughs> Cosinus condition ensures that uh, you can always pick an R so that it is contained. Now you come back and say that um, if, um, if that is finite, uh, then uh, either you need some growth uh, uh, lower uh, condition, so you maybe go back to that exact form. You will say a half u y squared plus ut squared dt. So this is now less than R. Right? So you know that the optimal control has to be inside this set because I am allowed to take R large enough. So, uh, so I have, so that immediately gives you, that immediately gives you a bound on, the, on your control and the bound, the precise bound you used in solvability theorem. So, you, and therefore, for each such uh, uh, U, you have this uh, unique solvability theorem. So you have the uh, estimates you have. Same estimates, same compactness, whatever you used uh, in, uh, in the improving existence theorem. And therefore, you can take, define what's called a minimizing sequence. And the minimizing sequences converge weakly. And there's a strong convergence coming out of this. Just So you know how to take the equation to limit. And uh, the fact that the minim this gives you the minimum is because of the, what's called the lower semi-continuity property. So those two tricks uh, is, is rather easy. if um, it is uh, convex. If it is not convex, the lower semi-continuity is not there. So you go and define what's called a, so this uh, uh, trick, I think one of the places where you can read this one done for the, an exterior problem is uh, my one of my earlier papers in this subject is called an optimal control problem in exterior. Hydrodynamics. Okay, so I take a moment to describe that problem, and then uh, the paper is fully downloadable. You can read and uh, and see how I write down the cost functional. There, actually, I derive the energy expenditure, and uh, and to take the limit like this. So the problem I uh, that problem I formulated is not uh, this kind of abstract problem. 
but uh, we go back to the cylinder problem. So you have a cylinder here. The difficulty in uh, so you, uh, in posing the problem is, uh, um, you know, how do you start and what is the initial data and so forth. So the the problem you start, I would like to start, is uh, I start from uh, I start gradually, very much like an airplane takes off from the <laughs> airport, and I accelerate to a speed of the cylinder, this is the LT is the sp speed of the cylinder, to a given speed called LT. So the, the, so the goal is to find this, um, this profile L, or oh, its derivative, I define the UT as uh, d L by dt, right, acceleration. Uh, the goal is to uh, define uh, goal is to find the optimal uh, way to accelerate so that to minimize the energy uh, expenditure. But uh, we want to go even slowly. How do you write the Navier Stokes equation in this case? Let's go even slowly. How about Newton equation? Right? Now, remember, uh, we sort of spoke uh, in situations where you are in the coordinate system of the body. You often see that in fluid mechanics. You are on the body and the fluid is coming from far field, right? But how do you, how would come, uh, how would one uh, arrive at such a situation? Can I fix the coordinate system here? And apply Newton's law? When, when does Newton's law apply? What is Newton's law? And I said, Bill Sears, he was in my qualifying exam along with C. Basson. Sears is like that. He, he posed this problem that he, if, uh, he, um, um, if an airplane passed by and you uh, are given a plane and you are given instruments, can you tell whether the airplane went this way or that way? And uh, I started saying that it's traffic plane in and things like that, but it was uh, that after two and a half hours into the interrogation. So I was <laughs> tired and so he also, <laughs> he said that statement. If you don't understand answer, then we'll go to Invisit. And if you don't understand Invisit, I'm going to go to Newton's law. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, he was a wonderful um, mentor and a partner, uh, always was with me during the time. See, yes, this was my advisor's advisor. Um, so I'm asking you, Newton's law, when do you apply the second law of Newton? Because this is very important when you formulate it. And if you don't, well, then you'll write down uh, and then function analytically prove something uh, totally nonsense. Right. So can you apply Newton's law? Uh, uh, what is the first, what type of coordinate frame you apply? How many of you study mechanics? Everybody study mechanics, right? What coordinate system you apply? What type, what is the coordinate system? Inertial frame, I, I thought I heard that. Did, they, did you say inertial frame? What's the inertial frame? With a lot of inertia? Momentum. <laughs> What's the inertial frame? Maybe I'll ask him. There's no external uh, source. The coordinate system is not accelerating. Right? The coordinate system should not be accelerating, uh, right? But now you want to fix the coordinate system on the body. So what do you, how do you derive this equation? Navier-Stokes, is it, uh, the body is accelerating. Does it make sense to write down the Navier-Stokes uh, and maybe in the moving domain? Um, um, you, you, let's say you fix it here. So the velocity is coming from there. But it's accelerating. So, um, where do you fix the coordinate system, right? Why it matters? Because uh, remember that if uh, if I fix the coordinate system here, the exterior domain is not changing. So your omega flow field is not uh, is not changing with time. It's okay. I will burn the next the ten, next ten minutes in this because I like this subject. <laughs> and um, so if if I fix the coordinate system here. The, the, uh, the domain here is not changing, right? That looks like a very good thing to do. So I, I, then I write down the Navier story. You have uh, seen it written down many, many times, right? So you go and then write down the navier stoke equation. And uh, then far field, you put a function of time, ut. 
Is that correct? If you say correct, you flung that uh, <laughs> uh, qualifying exam with uh, Sears and uh, Dixie Bears. If it's, um, it's because it's not correct. Why it is not correct? We have some more time to discuss this. Because I like this problem, we can discuss. Because once we understand how to formulate, how to extract the control and put it like a functional equation, then uh, it's a matter of taking the Jacobi Hamilton picture and writing the Navier Stokes and uh, right proving some functional analytic theorems. And that's what we have been doing in the last 20 years. But when you go back and think about it, you have to understand it correctly. In many fluid mechanics books, you have a, you teach fluid mechanics, you research in fluid mechanics, you, you find that they have a cylinder and then the flow field is coming at uh, speed in the far field. And you then you have another problem where the cylinder is moved and the flow field far away is, is um, constant, right? Are these same problems? How many of you are afraid of this question? Probably. Yeah. Right? You haven't thought about this question. What is the difference between these two? So I am telling that in, in, in a fluid mechanics book, you often see a cylinder sitting and the far field is Navier-Stokes equation written down. Far field is u, right? And you often declare that's the speed of the cylinder. The second problem, so that in that case, the exterior domain is um, fixed, but that's not the big deal here. I trust me because you are going to be about to make a big mistake if you don't understand that. And uh, the other problem, the, I just start with the you know, calm lake and I move the cylinder, right? But now if I go to the coordinate system of the cylinder, uh, the far field of the lake is moving. Are these same coordinate systems? What is the difference? In the first coordinate system, yes, I'll let you answer, yeah. Go ahead and answer so that we can correct. So in the first coordinate system, the coordinate system is fixed here. Stationary. It's a stationary coordinate system. The second one, the coordinate system is fixed on the body, right? What is wrong with that? The, the frame is moving. Yeah, but what's wrong with moving frame? Newton frame law applies. It is accelerating, right? It's an accelerating frame. I would have made a big mistake in this problem if I didn't know uh, classical mechanics, thanks to, and that I studied in Sri Lanka, <laughs> probably in first in high school. So the way you formulate this problem correctly is first uh, fix the coordinate system here. You can go and read this paper, is a reference I have given. Fix the whole coordinate system, write down the Navier-Stokes equation um, for that, but the more domain is moving. Then you apply a coordinate transform to go to this accelerating coordinate system because now you, you will find that there's an extra term coming on the uh, Navier-Stokes equation and that extra term would look like this. So in the five minutes I will write down the both versions of the Navier-Stokes equation. So that's, um, you know, since I, at the time I was an aerodynamicist, I wanted to formulate something very, very meaningful. In, uh, so I pick this problem because uh, W.R. Sears, my advisor's advisor, in the 1930s wrote a very famous paper called An Unsteady Airfoil Encountering a Gust, because he was, they were interested in uh, build, you know, designing aerodynamics. He was also the chief aerodynamics, uh, aerodynamicist for um, uh, Northrop Corporation. You know, they define, design what's called this YB-41, uh, which is the flying wing in the 1940s, which became the B-1 bomber. Same design, you know, you would have seen this B1 bomber, which is uh, only wing. Uh, so it was uh, his, his design. So first uh, we let the body move, it's okay. And fix the coordinate system here. So, the, uh, so then you, you're fine, you write down the Navier-Stokes equation. U, div of u is zero. So this is uh, in a domain omega t, because the body is moving, so the domain is changing in time, right? And u on the body is what?
you want the body is uh, whatever the speed of uh, given by that speed, right? So, is it uh, 0? There are the coordinate system fixed. I know you didn't come to learn coordinate system in this, uh, but if you don't know, then uh, that's why I'm sort of pressing. There are the coordinate system. Coordinate system is here. The body is moving, so it is uh, it's moving with, uh, uh, right? So it is LT, let's say E1. That's the velocity on the, because a particle here, I should have put a minus because it's moving, I took it this way. Uh, particle here is uh, moving with the cylinder. LG. So it's a minus because I, I want to. And uh, what is the far field velocity? As uh, as mod dex go to infinity. What's the far field velocity? Zero. Very good. Unless uh, there is uh, some turbulent field where you are running through. So you assume that the far field is zero. Now uh, we change the coordinate system. We change the coordinate system by moving the coordinate. So now if the coordinate system is fixed here, it's actually accelerating. So you, have, you can do a coordinate transform. This is the correct equation. This is correct because uh, this is Newton's law is correctly applied. So this is the correct equation. Now coordinate system fixed on the on the body. So if I fix the coordinate system on the body, you know, um, um, let me write with the same variables. Okay, so it will look like du by dt plus u dot gradient u is equal to minus gradient p plus nu Laplace u plus dl by dt times e1. E1 is the basic vector in the, the coordinate vector in that space. Div of u is equal to 0. This comes because you remember I started with this Lagrangian particle. So you had to go back and do a coordinate transformation more carefully. Uh, div of u is 0. What kind of domain is this one? This is just omega, more omega, because it's, uh, now you're on the coordinate system of the body. So exterior is fixed. Velocity on the body is what? What's the velocity on the body? <coughs> what is it? Zero, right? Because now you are you here. What did you do? Is you got on the and you have a seat on the airplane now, right? So um, you are moving. The coordinate system is moving. The velocity is measured with respect to you, and the other velocity is zero. What is the far field? So what is the far field velocity? That comes the most interesting. So u goes to what? As uh, mod x go to infinity. L, L. 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 So it is it goes to L of t e1. Is it positive or negative? The velocity is coming from there, right? Is positive. So it's are these two equations look the same to you? It's not the same. So many, many fluid mechanics books make mistakes or they, they haven't thought about this question. When will they be same? When, when the body is not accelerating, that term goes away. So that problem looks like this problem, right? And um, right, agreed? That's actually traditional engineers are here, and I know you are thoroughly humiliated by my arrogance in this. <laughs> but uh, I like this problem because it's um, so. What happens is here we manage to do two things. Uh, first, we wrote down the Navier-Stokes equation correctly. We were right. We started here in an inertial frame. This is inertial, and this is on a non-inertial frame. So the fact that you are on a non-inertial frame is not an end of the world, but you just said you should be able to get it right. There's another thing I noticed when I derived it. Notice that there's a right-hand side comes here, and I wanted to keep that as control, right? So where the control? There's a nice control on the right-hand side. 
and in this uh, problem I sort of regarded velocity and uh, the velocity of the flow field and the velocity of the objects as state variable and the rest is functional analysis once you get this right if you don't get this right then it's, uh, it's the functional analysis nothing to do with fluid mechanics so okay so um, um, this sort of came in this discussion um, as I uh, started thinking about it uh, in this moment um, we go back and uh, talk about uh, Pontryagin maximum principle dynamic programming and, and then uh, I'll tell you what happens in the stochastic case uh, this paper is useful for you to read because the program I just described I said the coerciveness and and uh, you need some cones inequality to be brought in and how to move the solubility work with the solubility and the coerciveness of the functional and show that there's an optimal control so the, th the theorem is that there exists an optimal acceleration to move uh, body from rest to a given speed in given time and um, so that started my thinking in this subject time for you to yeah <laughs> yeah good very good very good uh, now there is other things also uh, if um, if the if you want to study rotating fluid right um, there is the the, the very current uh, work um, in by people like giga you know the, the, the pd big guns is they are looking at rotating flows uh, that's also this intuition we spoke about is very relevant there what happens is a uh, rotating frame, if you go and do, the, you get what is called a Coriolis uh, term and that uh, will look like U cross uh, uh, omega is the rotation, okay. That uh, does not doesn't appear to introduce a difficult term there. Is it a difficult term? No, because we dealt with uh, unbounded operators, nonlinear. This is just a linear term, but the difficulty is elsewhere uh, in, in, in precisely the point we discussed, right. What happens to the far field? What happened to the far field here when, uh, when the body was moving? The far field was, uh, when you're on the coordinate system of the body, the far field was coming to you, right? Likewise, when you rotate, you go to the uh, body's coordinate system, the far field is rotating. So it turns out that the far field uh, is what? Uh, radius times, right? So that uh, far field goes to infinity, so you are dealing with an initial data which can possibly blow up, at, uh, which will blow up, non-L2 initial data. So it is a, uh, it's a very, very um, important and uh, sort of frontier uh, thing in Navier-Stokes to look at uh, um, a situation where the initial data is not in L2 because you are rotating and you know, the far field is rotating, right? And you can read the uh, recent article by Giga and to handle uh, non-L2 initial data. You cannot get around that. So what people did was, uh, uh, well, the far field is sort of decaying. Uh, that's uh, not very interesting, at least, give, you know, this. Um, so they, uh, so the, you can Google and find out. It's a downloadable article by Giga and maybe Mahalov and somebody else. Uh, solubility theorem for Navier-Stokes for rotating with uh, the genuine far field <laughs> um, condition the way we formulated here. Here also there is a difficulty, but uh, so here also I have... Uh, uh, far field is not zero, right? And therefore, you know, you have a function that goes to a finite value, and therefore you will have to deal with uh, non-L2, but it's possible to extend the and subtract off uh, some basic fields, like the way Hoff did. Um, so you, uh, to get around here. Uh, anyway, but the rotation is a very big thing in Chandrasekhar's book. Uh, Chandrasekhar's many of his investigations. Perlowski's book on geophysical fluid dynamics and so forth, the, 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 because the, m most of the weather you see is also closely related to that uh, Coriolis system. And you can think of it as a control term, feedback control. Notice that the, the rotation naturally occurs, occurs as a feedback term. If you think of that as some control, U is uh, right. So there is feedback in the nature, <laughs> feedback control in the nature. N nobody ever brought down control theory to understand that. Okay. <coughs> Sorry to take you through inertial frames and what not, but if you don't, then you will write down possibly uh, that and uh, uh, this one with a fixed, uh, without that term and things like that. You know, it's good to correctly understand it. Time to lunch. Mm.